Hi, Pierre. Uh, how you I'm so good, much. thank you. Good. Thank you so much for joining us um, t tonight. Um, now, the, the house whisperer, do you whisper to houses? I, I do. I connect to the, uh, the soul of buildings and really listen to what they want to say to me um, that perhaps their owners can't hear and uh, see what the problems are that are running in the house and how they're affecting people's lives. So just explain, so you talk to houses, so you walk into a house and you say, oh, you tell me, what do you, I mean, I was going to be a little bit jovial there and say, oh, hello house, how are you? But, but what do you do? Well, I, I, I kind of get a sense of um, the house before I actually even go there when somebody calls or uh, and I speak to them, you know, what their issues are, and um, I, I get some understanding. I, I, I just feel the emotion of a house. I've always had that ability since a young child. I walk past a house and I can kind of feel its pain. I can feel its emotion. I can feel it kind of beckoning me sometimes, you know, and saying something. Okay, so so okay, so we're talking we're talking about bricks and mortar. Right, are we? Well, is, you know, they... well, bricks and mortar, you know, um, everyth everything has consciousness in this universe. And bricks and mortar are very physical, three-dimensional um, materials. But within that and within the whole beingness and the space of a house, there is uh, the spirit of the house, you know, the consciousness of the building. And... It, it, it's got a soul, a house has a soul, and the question is how does it relate to the owners and what effect is the relationship, because it is a relationship that people have with their home, whether they love it or hate it, there is a relationship and that is what I work in reading and understanding and unravelling for people in, in order to help them over whatever issue they've called me for. Right, okay. So you, well, you, you, you're here with us at Radio Harrow tonight and you've got a lovely t-shirt on that says on the front, I talk to houses, and on the back it says, and they talk back. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, now, but it's more than houses, isn't it? It's, it's people's homes, it's flats, it's caravans, it could be anything. And anything where people live because it is, as I say, that connection that people have. Uh, it's, it's, it is like another relationship and if it works smoothly and well then everything in life can just run a lot better but what is interesting is that the house itself will bring up stuff that will force us to look at what's going on in our life and because um, in a sense what i'm working with is the psychotherapy of space that, that's what i'm doing Okay, psychotherapy of space. Absolutely. This yeah. sounds fascinating. Yes. Okay, it's uh, 21 and a half, rocking minutes to nine now. It's uh, Radio Harrow, I'm Pierre Petru, and I'm joined in the studio by the, the House Whisperer. Now, we've got, some, we've got a question for you already, uh, Christian, which we'll, we'll ask you in a second, but talk to us more first about uh, the psychotherapy of space. Well, the, the relationship we have with our homes goes much deeper than just bricks and mortar. The... When we find a home, we are attracted to it because there's something in the building that calls us. It has a resonance with a story that we're running in our own life. And sometimes that's actually running quite deep in the subconscious. Um, and so we are literally into psychotherapy land and psychotherapy talk. So um, understanding that deep uh, in a language of what the person is really seeking and what the building is reflecting and talking to me about allows me to get closer to helping the, uh, the owner to understand what their own issue is. So I'm not going in to fix anything. I'm actually illuminating for the owner of uh, a property what it is that is running uh, in their deeper subconscious. So, so almost parallel? Uh, they run in parallel, absolutely. Okay, um, Okay. before I ask, there's just so much to get through. In fact, let's go to the questions first. So I've got a question from um, from John Owens who says, is, is the connection that you have, is it the past people who have lived 
in that house. The people who have lived there before uh, is, is a major consideration in this work. Everything that has ever happened in a house, in a building, on the land even before it was built, will leave a residue, it will leave a memory. And so, so, sorry to interrupt, so it's like recorded. It's recorded, yes. So, it's, so anything that happens, so for example, even us today, so where yes. I live in my house, yes. everything that goes on in my house today is recorded by the house. Yep. So in a hundred years' time, yes. it's, it's there still. It, it's there in some form. And uh, if you look at it as if it's recorded in the ether, in the Akasha, and we talk about the Akashic records, and if you can tune into them, and simply we're talking about space, Akasha is space. So if we tune into space, we can actually hear or feel or sense at some level the history of the house. Now, whoever has lived there before will certainly have an impact on your life. And what I've often seen is people get so confused where they live when there's lots of stuff going on that they actually end up not living their own life, but living the lives of those who have lived there before. Right, okay, so, um, so there could be things going on in our lives today that are because of where we live. That's right, absolutely. Okay, let's have another yeah. question now. We've got Roy Harvey, who's, uh, who's written into us uh, tonight. Now, Roy says, the house whisperer. Now, he's, he, this is, I'm just gonna read this email from Roy. Uh, he says, where I live was the nearest place I could get to, uh, to my new job in London, and 30 years on, and I'm retired now, he says, I'm still here. Why did I settle here and not move away? I love the countryside and became part of the community. Uh, is this not what most people do? So I suppose he's sort of saying, he moved to London, it was near to his job and everything, um, and uh, he, he thought that once he ret he's, uh, retired, he's gonna go back out to the countryside, but he's still where he is 30 yeah. years later. Yeah. So, yeah, what happens is uh, when we do move to somewhere and the reason we are attracted is, is a very uh, interesting one in the first place because, yes, we say it's because of a job or we, it's all we could afford or there are all kinds of reasons why we end up where we do and we, we can talk a long time about that. But when we are attracted to somewhere, there will be a matching pattern, a matching resonance with that building with a story that is running in your life. Now, you might be aware of what that story is, or it will be running in the subconscious. And again, we're going back to the psychotherapeutic aspect of the relationship. Now, once you start living somewhere for a few years, and particularly when you're talking about 30 years, that's a long time, the relationship you will have formed with your house will make it very difficult to, to move from it. And what people don't consider when they do try to move is, does the house actually want to let you go? Oh, wow. Because So if, if that's the case, it, it, I don't know, we're talking a lot here, but if that's the case, one more question and we'll have some music. Um, when you go to buy a house, does, obviously you choose that house, don't you? Uh, no. <laughs> we now we think we choose that house of course we have an idea we have a checklist of what we want how many bedrooms the area garden so on and so on but what people don't consider is that the house actually finds them right. and I have many examples of this but I, actually in reality it's a bit of both the again it comes back to the matching stories you have an idea of what you want in your potential relationship with a house, but so does the soul of the house. Remember the, the house, the flat, the property has a consciousness, it has an awareness, and it is running its own pattern and subconscious patterns, and it is seeking its owner. So when they both meet, then you come together and people often say, wow, I could live here. The house was still with us, and um, I've got another question for you, uh, Christian, here. Uh, let's just bring it up for you. Now, um, I've got a message from Susie Majuto, who's listening, and she says, uh, does the house not let you go because the spirits want you to stay? <laughs> well, it depends if there are spirits there, but that can be the case. Um, there are various reasons why we have a problem in actually leaving a house or selling a house. And that is often because, if we go back a step, 
when we have been attracted to a house, there is a connection, there is a, a bigger purpose in being there. It's like a soul contract, if you like, with the property. And when we come to want to leave it for whatever reason, the question is, have you fulfilled that soul contract that you were originally drawn there to? And if you have, have you, in your heart, actually let the property go, let your home go? If it's no to both of those, then um, it's then difficult to actually leave or sell the house. Now, I want to ask you something, actually, Christian. And what I want to ask you is um, it's something quite interesting. As a child, so uh, not that long ago, really, but as a child, my brother and I used to always swap bedrooms, OK, um, which, we, which was always interesting. But then as we kind of got older, I had the bigger bedroom and decided that swapping was no, not, not for me anymore. But what I used to do was every now and again, I used to think to myself, when things weren't going right in my life, so if I was like, I don't know, I, was, I wasn't doing well at school, and my friend, I don't know, all sorts of things that you, all sorts of issues as a child you think are, are the main things going on. I used to think, well, I'm going to change everything. I'm going to change my room around. I'm going to move my bed. I'm going to move the wardrobe, the chest of drawers, and everything. And then I'd, th and I'd clean up everything. I'd clean the house, the, the bedroom rather, and I'd... And I think that by rearranging the bedroom, I'm somehow, this is me as a child here, thinking that somehow I was rearranging my life. Now, is that nonsense? I've never shared that with anyone. You're, what you're talking about is the absolute essence of what this work is about. Wow, so I'm not mad. No, you're not <laughs> mad. Um, no, we both are. <laughs> we both are, yes, that's, that's really the... Yeah. Uh, what happens is, when we, when we have the desire to change our space it's our external space and our external space our house the rooms the furniture all the artifacts in it are a reflection of who we are or who we think we are or who we believe we are or who we want to be and so that inner projection projected out is what uh, we have you know around us so when something doesn't feel right and we want to change something in life, whether it's career, relationships, financial, anything at all, we often look outside ourselves and look at our furniture and start to change it. But the change isn't because we've moved the furniture, it's because we've made the shift inside and then we'll pick up a piece of furniture, for example, and move it. But the actual real work is done inside. So we're back to the, the kind of psychotherapeutic aspect of, do I want to change? And therefore, I'll change my environment. When, when I moved in, into my uh, house, my first house, seven, just over seven years ago, and um, it's, not, it's not a huge place. It's, not, you know, it's just a small place for me. Um, and but I kind of like I dressed it up a little bit in the style I like, and I kind of like the um, like for example my my kitchen is very much an an old fashioned cottage kitchen type look. But in the hallway, okay, this is really the hallway I feel is important uh, upstairs and downstairs. And in the hallways, um, I've got marble statuettes um, sitting there, and I've got chandeliers, small chandeliers. They're not crystal. But they're quite, they're, they're small and they look like they're crystal. I mean, they're only seven quid. But they're, they're, and this, and I've chosen that for that for my house. Now, have I chosen it, or is it because the house wanted to be dressed up? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a bit of both, actually. Now, if you think that you have chosen your house, your host has cho house has chosen you, so you've got that relationship going anyway, then if you are totally. Um, you know, in harmony with your house, you're both going to be choosing that. Now, the problem comes when you actually are not in harmony with where you live, which, of course, is, is most of the, uh, the work that I do. People call me out when things are not working in life. Um, so when you're out of harmony with your house, you're very unlikely to be choosing something that you're going to love and feel good with and the house is so it's going to create tension okay so uh, so my house probably is happy with the fact that it's got marble statuettes in the hallway and uh, crystal chandeliers well pierre you are greek yeah <laughs> of course <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't resist that one <laughs>
we spoke earlier a little bit about the, the fact that um, moving um, furniture around and stuff. And Stephanie Williamson's uh, come to us and said, rearranging furniture is always refreshing. I agree with your house whisperer. Um, she says declutter. Now, talk about clutter. What about clutter? Well, clutter is, is a big thing with... Um uh, with space clearing and people use the word space clearing but I would um, a word of warning to actually go in and clear space or to clear somebody else's space can actually be quite dangerous now it is of course a positive thing to to clear and have a good space around us but you have to remember that clutter is a reflection it's an externalized metaphor of clutter inside us so issues that we haven't dealt with in our life, uh, and they could be deep subconscious issues we're not even aware of, uh, will reflect in the clutter we have around us. And this is why it's hard to actually clear clutter, because we haven't dealt with those inner issues. Right, right, OK. I, need, I definitely need to come in here. Um, now, as I said, uh, you, did, you said to me you want to talk to me about my um, my crystal chandeliers and the marble statue. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, mm. dear. Oh, dear. It's bad news coming my way, folks. Um, so Christian's going to tell me about that in a second. But I want to ask you, since we're talking about clutter, now I said that I moved seven years ago. This is a little bit embarrassing, but I work really hard. A lot of people know I've got a very full-on life. And I have still got two bedrooms full of boxes that I haven't unpacked yet. Mm-hmm. Oh, it sounds like he knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we have stuff in, in our house, if, if you consider that every part of the house is a reflection of part of our body, part of our energetic body and physical body, and if we have it full of uh, boxes, now, if, if that is... Um, stuff that we're keeping that we don't need, then it becomes clutter. Storage is something else. Storage is okay, but when we don't need it, want it, it becomes clutter, and it will clutter our life at every single level. But what it um, often reflects is some part of your life that you don't want to deal with, and that's what I look at as the house whisperer. Okay, okay. Um, so I've got, like I said, I've got, I, I think that there is some things I probably don't need anymore, but I, I know that there's a lot of things there, like um, my record collection of things that I, I do need. <laughs> but, uh, but I wanted to ask you, because a couple of years after I moved, and, and just inter uh, this is, again, it's a Pierreism thing, so you might say that I'm totally wrong here. But um, a couple of years after I moved to my house, um, I, I surprisingly surprised the doctors and everyone because I got diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. Um, and could it be the fact that, for example, I've left, up for two years I left all those boxes like that, or could it be, I, I don't know, is it something to do with it? Because it's, it's very unlikely that um, after a certain age that you become a type 1 diabetic. So I did surprise all the doctors and everything around that. And I wondered if it had anything to do with the fact that I, where I live. And, yeah, and, and yeah, absolutely. Health and our space is absolutely, totally connected and quite, quite a crucial uh, um, situation, really, because if we don't deal with uh, issues that can be reflected in clutter, then what happens is that the energy of the space gets so dense that our energy can't free up and feel good and our health is based on um, having our natural flow of energy through the body and the energy fields just constantly flowing freely now clutter will inhibit that but that clutter remember is only reflecting issues inside you that you haven't dealt with or want to look at whether it's to do with childhood stuff or relationship stuff you know we've all got things in our past that we'd rather bury but you can't bury stuff it's there festering under the surface and it will somehow reflect um in in our environment okay so so i want to ask you one more thing we'll have some music and we'll come back to you but so what um, i live alone yes okay and i know you want to talk about that and the, and the statues and everything we'll come back to that in a sec but when i go home or when people go home does the house kind of like think, oh, great, my owner's back? 
Okay, it's like that, a welcome sort of thing. Uh, well, that's what we would like it to do. The purpose of a house, from my point of view, is that it should welcome you when you come home. It should put its arms around you, make you feel safe, make you feel comfortable. Now, if it doesn't, then there is something not right with where you live. Christian, so, so tell me now, tell me about uh, these... Um these uh, marble statuettes that I've got in my house that you say are something to do with why I'm single? <laughs> when we have items of single items, they are symbolic of being single, being alone. Now, you chose them. Yeah. They didn't appear. So you chose them because part of you is running the single man energy the attitude of being single. Now, that can be okay at the time when you bought those statues, but let's say a few years down the line, you decide, okay, I've had enough of being single, I want to get out there, I want to meet someone, I want to be in a partnership. The energy, the attitude, the program that you set up when you bought those single statues is still running, and that's what needs to be changed. So get rid of the statues. <laughs> no, that doesn't, that doesn't change it on its own. Okay. The getting rid of it, you will only get rid of them once you decide inside, okay, now I'm really ready to shift into a relationship. Okay. So it's up to you. Okay. Now, Angela's an estate agent, uh, and she says that, uh, that occasionally she gets a bad feeling from a house, and if she does, she can't sell it or rent it. Is the house telling me something, or is it trying to tell her something? She oh. only gets this occasionally, but yeah. she, they, she does get it, yeah. and every time she's up, it's yeah. just the feeling she gets. Yeah, it's an absolute classic, this, and there is a whole chapter in my book on buying and selling houses. And it's an absolute classic, this, and there is a whole chapter in my book on buying and selling houses. And... Uh, I've often worked with people and uh, I have to say uh, estate agents are really the hardest people to convince about this. So I'm really glad you're um, asking this question and experiencing this. So to rationalise it, what happens is that if the owner has not, as I said earlier on, fulfilled their sole purpose for being in that house, the house will not want to let them go. So that's one aspect. But if there is spirit activity in the house, somebody has died and they haven't let go of the house, they will actually be still running a program of, it's my house, and maybe they have formed a relationship with you and they don't want you to go. So they're going to make it impossible for a sale to happen. So I can share some success stories with this and... How okay. That's worked. Okay. Well. Okay. Well, that leads us nicely. Uh, Roy Harvey says that the wife wants to know. Um, uh, let's have a look here. This house doesn't want you. If this house doesn't want you anymore, would you have to go? Well, I would be looking at understanding, and this is what the whispering is to actually listen to the the heart and soul of the house. Why would it not want you? So I would suggest you sit really quietly with the house and tune into it, uh, whether you want to light a candle or some incense or whatever your thing is, that's okay. There's no ritual that works or doesn't work. It's whatever makes you feel comfortable, uh, settled and in a state that you can really connect and listen and feel what is actually going on? So we don't have to actually hear it with our ears. It's, you know, many people just get a sense of what's going on. But the problem with doing this ourselves is that because we are running the same programs, that the house is, that is perhaps causing the issue, it's very hard to see our own stuff. And this is why when somebody outside comes in, um, and when I go to a house, I can usually see straight away even before I've got to the place what the issues are that are running and my work is to actually allow uh, the owner to come to the realization themselves I don't go in and say this is what's going on and you've got to do this and that it doesn't work that way because this is about you it's not about me fixing something this is about you seeing what's going on in your life and most importantly taking personal responsibility to make the changes.
Right, okay. But I wanted to ask you, Christian, so let, talking about what you're, you're, you're sort of like um, alluding to here, so that's a, a hypothetical situation. Let's talk about um, someone that lives in a house um, and, um, I don't know, the, 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 the family home has been broken uh, and, uh, and the man's there and uh, I'm just sort of making this up as I go along, just as an example, um, and he's heartbroken, his wife's gone and everything else. And um, he's looking at his house, and it's and, and it's empty now. The house. He's sort of going around all the different rooms, and he's seen the chair that where she used to be, and everything else that's going around this house. So when he moves from that house, and a new family move in, or someone else moves in, what happens there? Well, that family is going to walk into that broken marriage. <gasps> and what's going to happen? It will affect their life. In virtually the same way, it's a pattern of program. It's like a video recording, and it will play back. A building will just constantly play back. And I've seen this time and time again. But let's go one step even deeper, which is more important for this uh, conversation. And that is, why were you attracted to a house with a broken family in the first place? Okay, Christian, you say that, um, that when, you, when there's a house that's experienced that separation and that heartbreak, the new family or whoever's going to move in might also experience that. That's, and, that's and, right. Any, I mean, is this true? Have you got any examples? Oh, many, many. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are many in the book that are describing quite a lot of detail. And there, there are quite a few um, YouTube clips on my website as well if people want to take a look at those. Now... What happens is the, uh, whether it's bankruptcy, divorce, um, uh, all kinds of problems that have been set up by the previous family will still be running in the atmosphere. And for some reason, a new family get attracted to that house or flat. And the chances are that their lives will go the same way. Okay. It's just so interesting. Okay, I'm, I've got another thing for you. Now, my brother, um, he's, uh, uh, he's had some trouble in the house in terms of he's, one of the drains um, got blocked. It not, when I say drain, it's kind of like, you know the ones that's completely covered? It's not a drain where you know, sure. the drain, right? And it got blocked, um, and whoever came out, they came out and they unblocked it. Yes. And it, but then he got this big block. Yeah, yeah, you knew I was yeah, going to say uh, that. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, as, as an architect, um, I can give you a very rational explanation for block drains, but that's not what we're talking about. This program is about the energy of our houses, the energy of our space. Now, everything is a reflection of something that is not flowing in our energy field. So he may be experiencing some kind of blockage in his own body medically, and this is where the link with health and buildings comes in. Okay, I, I, I'm going to come in here because um, he does. He, my brother's been very unwell lately, um, and I've, I'll be honest, the, the, the block drain has, has come to do with... He's actually been struggling breathing lately. Um, they don't think it's anything serious. Yeah. They think it's the side effect of, yeah. um, of some medication or something. But, but you see, the important thing here, and this is a valuable lesson we can learn from our homes, is that they will give us indications of what is going on health-wise. And if we listen, we will um, get an idea of what's going on. Now, if we ignore it, the problem is, you know, we, we might get a plumber in to clear it because we think the problem is the drain. But people don't usually think the problem's actually in my body. But now remember, our body is purely reflected out into our space that we live. So the two are totally uh, interlinked, intertwined. And therefore, if we listen to the messages our home is giving us, we can learn a lot about our own health. Okay, so with my brother, just to, to give the example, um, his, his drain's blocked. So, he, so could it be that because the drain is blocked, he's not well? And, and it's worth the drain. If there's something wrong in your house, it's worth getting it fixed because it might end up making you yes. real. Yeah, one, once it's manifest, then you've got to physically clear it. It's not going to magically disappear. Right. Um, 
But, and so when you do that, it'll allow you the chance of seeing what it is that's blocked in you. Now, if you ignore that, the drain's going to block again. Okay, so you need to address the issue that you've got. Exactly. What is running inside you? Because the externalised issues, whether it's uh, and damp and leaks and this sort of thing, that plumbers can't fix, electricians can't sort out, it's because we haven't dealt with it inside. Now, everybody knows light bulbs will just go and they're guaranteed for thousands of hours, but, you know, some of them suddenly just go. And this is purely an energetic thing. If we get angry and create emotion, our house will reflect that. And usually electrical things, computers, computers are a classic for crashing when we're under stress. And that's because our emotional energy is so charged up at that point, everything just breaks down. And, you know, everything's energy is digital in that sense. So it will affect machines. OK, my brother um, has actually got leaking bath taps. He's had them for a while. Um, I, I bought him some taps last week because mm -hmm. he kept going on. And he's having them fixed as we speak. Right. OK, but what is a leaking tap, is that a, is that a specific... I mean, you know, at one level, without being uh, speaking to your brother and actually getting a sense of what's going on, but I'm kind of picking up a little bit in the background here. But water is emotion. So if, if we have too much emotion running, then leaks can happen. And this is a very common thing. You sort out something that's going on in your emotional life and then suddenly... You've got to cancel the plumber because you don't need him to come round. Right, OK, <laughs> so that's a message from my brother there. He's got uh, a, a leaking tap and a, and a leaking drain. So, yeah, thank you very much. Now, um, talk to us about your book, um, The House Whisperer, Christian, because um, it just looks absolutely fascinating. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a world that um, a lot of people don't know. In the book, looking at the book, it's kind of like it looks a very easy to read. It, although what we're talking about is it can be somewhat complex yeah the book looks very easy to read and understand yeah i i felt it was very important um i, I deal with a lot of um energy and work with a lot of strange things and you know you can go really deep into philosophy of stuff and life but it was important to write a book that was very accessible and in very uh, not simplistic, but very simple to understand language about our everyday connection to life and where we live. And it really contains uh, the last 20 years of work and over 1,100, the experience of 1,100 consultations that I've done with people's homes. So it's quite a substantial um, amount of experience that has gone into it. And I draw even further back to my early architectural years of working in commercial buildings and homes and airport interiors and so on. And my whole architectural side and interior design side, uh, it's kind of merged into that. Now, um, Christian, I've got another, uh, another Pierreism that I want to ask you about, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and that is... Um, a, a, a really good friend of mine, right? It's, it's really ironic. Again, she's the only other person that I've discussed this with. Yeah. And I, I mentioned this to her about, I, I think she actually mentioned it to me first, about uh, 18 months or two years ago. We both realised, this is really odd, that when we clean our houses, and empty the bins, there, there, might be more, there may be more things we're supposed to be doing, but we've realised that when the house is, when we've vacuum cleaned the house, we've dusted it all, we've polished everything, everything's in its place, we've emptied the bins, the bin, all the bins in the bedroom, in the kitchen, the bathroom, all the bins have been emptied, and there's, and everything is just perfect. Yeah. That things are just better in our lives. What, what's, of course, that? because you've actually made a choice, made a decision to just clear out something in your life and you're externalizing it by clearing out the clutter in your space and emptying the bins and cleaning. You know, this whole thing of cleanliness is next to godliness, you know, is actually a very powerful statement because if we clean our space, it means we've made a decision to clean something in our inner space. And the two are totally connected. And so you will feel better. 
So, so it's it's really so just like at the moment, I have to admit, yesterday it just so happened that I did give my house a good old clean. It's all vacuum cleaned and it's yeah. all it, well, there's no dust anywhere yeah. uh, and everything else, um, and all the bins are empty. And that is strange. Yeah, but of, often people are not able to even pick up the bit of uh, rubbish that's on the floor. And I've been to some houses where you could hardly walk through the house from the clutter, uh, serious, serious stuff. And there's not a hoping chance of anyone even starting to clear that or have the inner energy. And there is another aspect that uh, one should consider is the earth energy that the house is built on. And this is very important because uh, this is when we get into the realms of what we call geopathic stress and geomancy. So when the energy of the earth is, let's call it negative for, for the moment, um, it will have a, a detrimental effect on our health and make things very difficult. It will create like treacle, like sludge in our house. And we could say, uh, and, and again as an architect, I would say to other professionals, don't build on certain areas because it will create illnesses, it will create cancers, it will create all sorts of problems and this is, you know, as I say often and on my website, architects are responsible for people's health because of the buildings they build and how they build them, the materials they build them in, but more importantly, where they build them. Okay, so so I'm just trying to think now where my house is and what was so people should try and find out what was on the land that they live in. It would be it would be useful but you know life is such these days that uh, you know whatever is going on on the land it's more a question of okay what do we do about it how do we fix it how do we resolve it. So it can be resolved. Oh absolutely and this is what I spend most of my my time doing as a, as a consultant. I would go to people's houses and I would discover that um, th there was one family who just could not settle. Their lives were in chaos. And as I sat in the house, all I could sense was this energy rushing through from the front door to the back door. And I said, what, what was on this site before? He says, oh, the house was built on a main road. Right, OK. So literally, they, they blocked a road and then built houses on them. But the energy, the memory of those cars running on that road is still working there, like that video replay, and affecting their life. OK, now, I'm, I want to ask you, because I live, on, um, I live out in the country in a little village, and I know um, that um, the big house, the huge house on the corner of where I live is, um, was once um, a butcher's shop. Part of it was a butcher's shop. That's at the, I, I don't live there, but that's at the end of the road, or the end of the lane. Um, and I understand that um, where my house and uh, the house next door was, was where the, um, where the animals would graze. Okay, in front of where we um, we live, there's a there's kind of like there's the lane, and then there's a big house in front of us, um, and there uh, apparently was the slaughterhouse. But that's in front. But but on the actual house that yeah. I live in, mm -hmm. it's where the animals would graze. Sure. Now yeah. is that okay? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's better than um, it's okay, but there are other issues going on there because they're all related. But if you were living in a property that was a slaughterhouse, then you will have that energy, that emotion of the dying animals in trauma. And that will seriously, and I've come across this several times, it will uh, devastate your life. But I come back to what I said earlier, that why have you chosen to go and live in an ex-slaughterhouse? Now you might say, I, I didn't know about it, but no, something inside us at a subconscious level knows we all have this innate um, sensitivity. We may not know how to express it or understand it, but there is an attraction to property, a resonance to it. Um, and by meeting that relationship in a property, in a house or a flat, there, there is that kind of ongoing unfolding of, of our connection to the house and to life in general. 
Okay, so what about people then that, for example, may um, live in, in prisons? I mean, there's some people that obviously spend their lives in prison. What, what, how does this fit in with, with that? I've not had any experience working with people in, in prisons, but um, I've had plenty of experience of people living in prison in their home. Oh, okay. Because if their space is keeping them locked in because of unresolved issues uh, within themselves, then they will create uh, a prison. And people will often say to me, um, I feel like a prisoner in my own home. I can't escape. I can't get out. And I've got um, a question here for, for you, um, Christian, from, uh, from John Owens, who says, uh, so let's have a look here. So here, here, I'm just going to try and find it here. Um, so the house is, a re he's asking, is the house a reflection of the owner? Does it mean that if the owner is ill, the house is ill? Absolutely. There is a total connection. And that's really what we've been speaking about this evening, that the house is an externalised metaphor of our inner house. So your belief systems, your attitudes, your health and well-being and relationships and so on will be reflected and connected to the house. So if one is successful, so is the other. Okay. Um, good evening to Emma Pierce uh, from Thornton Heath, who's listening tonight. Uh, how are you doing, Emma? Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Rock and Radio Therapy family. So, Christian, if someone arranges a consultation with you, um, you turn up to their house. Are you there for an hour, a day? What do you do, and what do th what do you leave the owner with? Do you like or, or give them a prescription? Sure. <laughs> yeah, a what? bit like that. Um, it, it does vary. An average home consultation is around five hours. It it can take longer. It's very deep. It in it involves me talking to the person or the family and finding out well, what is going on and that process of listening is actually the work happening it's not just let's listen to what the problem is and fix it it's not how I work the process of listening um, allows me to go deeper and hear their inner story the psychotherapy of their their life and also at the same time I'm listening to the house and how it's reacting with them and so I'm building up a picture and I could then become aware of uh, strange energy in the space or leftover energies from before or any spirit activity and so on and we'll walk around the property and uh, get a sense of it and sometimes uh, I will get the the owner to hold a pair of dowsing rods which uh, many people uh, are not familiar with but uh, are fascinated by because the movement of the rods will actually show them how the energy is fluctuating as they go through the house and then by the end of the day when everything is resolved the rods would all some something completely different um, so that that's kind of um, and there is a kind of space clearing process that goes on but it, it's too detailed to go into now, but the idea is to bring the heart and soul of the people into total heart resonance with the heart and soul of the house. And once that happens, people will often say, ah, oh, I feel at home. Wow. Okay, um, we've got the quarter to sing to coming up in about five minutes. Um, I know, I know that uh, it's a very special show, but we've got to do our little sing along, and that's coming up shortly. Uh, thank you to Arlene in Scotland who says, "I'm absolutely loving this. It's so interesting." Thank you very much, Arlene. And Christine in uh, in Cyprus says, says uh, "Hi Pierre, say hello to Angela and the rest of the family." Now, what I want to ask you, uh, Christine in Cyprus lives at number four. She moved from, um, from England several years ago. She lives at number four uh, in her house in Cyprus. When she lived in, um, in England, she lived at number 43. Okay, so there's two fours there. Um, and, and you probably know where I'm going with this. I want to say my brother uh, currently lives at a number three. Um, where he lived before, he lived at number 12. And one and two equals three. And when my, when my brother lived in Cyprus previous to that, he lived at number three. Mm -hmm. And then before that, he <laughs> lived at number 37. Yeah. So another three's yeah. in there. 
Okay, well, we're talking about numerology here, and number is energy, and there are many systems, and uh, I, I work with several systems to do with numbers, and one is nine star key astrology. Sorry, say that again. Nine key, nine star key astrology. Okay. And from your birth date, it's a Japanese system, and from your birth date, you get three numbers that actually show your balance of energy, but they also show you which cycle you are in a nine year cycle, whether you're on a high or a low or a plateau and so on. But numbers are, are indeed very powerful and significant. But if you consider that our energy fields, our, our belief systems are whatever they are, we can be attracted to a certain number because it has a certain vibration. For example, a number one is to do with singleness and beingness. So you could end up being single. You don't live at number one, do you, Pia? No, I don't. No. Okay. What number do you live at? I'm not telling you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, we could we could do a, another whole show on numerology. Okay, all right. Uh, let's have a bit more music, and we'll come back to Christian shortly. We've talked about um, about the negativity in these houses, um, whether it be the land that they were built on, or whether it be the the recording of the people that previously lived there. Um, surely, uh, you must be able to to uh, to break. The, the spell, as it were, or the... Or oh, the, absolutely. Like, cycle. Yeah, that, that is the whole point of going to work with people, is, is actually reading what is actually going on, getting uh, a bigger picture of the understanding of the energies that are running, and finding a way of resolving the problems and releasing all the... Uh, negative energies are impeding people's lives. So, it can, so, of course, the cycles can be broken. Absolutely, yeah. Roy Harvey says, uh, can you explain why our pets nearly always return to the house when people move? So if, for example, you've moved to the, the, the house, the, the pet knows its way back home. Yeah, well, there, there is a resonance, there's a memory, but also people, you know, will uh, um, often return back to their home in their dreams. Because if you haven't resolved and really left a house, and this is really important because when we sell a house and we move, we, it's important that we let it go, that we say thank you to it, we honour it, because if we don't, we are still attached to it, and therefore, we are affecting the people who move into the house, but also, their lives are affecting our lives, because you've created like a, a link between the two. It, it's interesting, <laughs> I've got a chuckle, because it's really interesting. Um, when I moved out of, um, of the family home uh, several years ago now, um, I'd lived there, I think, for over 30 years, and I was the last person to, to sort of leave the house, and I, and I couldn't just leave. Um, I remember my, my, uh, my dad and my brother, they just sort of walked out and, and off they went, but I didn't, I actually walked, and this is really odd, but I walked into every single room, mm. and in my mind, it was like a film, I was like replaying all the different things that you know, in the past 30 years that had gone on in the yeah. living room, in the bedrooms, yeah. in the wherever. And I just thought, and, and I did, I kind of said, thank you and mm. goodbye, because that has brought me so many happy yeah, so important. And it sounds like you had the emotional attachment to the house, and it, it just varies. It depends on your relationship. And we're back to relationships again. We are. And, and just quickly on that, I've actually gone back to that house, because the, the, the new owner invites me back for a cup of tea every now and again. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. I go back. Yeah. I mean, there can't be many people that move from their house mm -hmm. and still every now because I'm still in touch with the, the new lady that lives there. And, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, she but the question to you from the house whisper is have you truly let that house go now to allow the new owner to enjoy it fully? Well, I haven't been for a while, so probably. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Christian, we'll, we'll talk more about your, um, your website, your book, and how people can get in touch in a second after some more from Ricky Nelson. Okay, Christian, um, so uh, Mr. Harvey um, uh, mentioned uh, something about pets coming back. Um, and you've got a lot of experience around um, a lot, Yes, I, I work a lot with animals, the, the equine and cats and dogs particularly, and I find that, uh, that the thing with cats and dogs, they, their nature is to look after their owners. And cats, for example, they will absorb negative energy in a house, whereas dogs are the opposite, they will avoid it. Now the thing is, when a cat comes and lies on you, it may be loving you, of course, but also they can be protecting and taking off negative energy that
Christian, before we go, tell us how people can um, learn more about what you do and the House Whisperer, where they can get your brilliant book, and also how can they book consultations and everything else? Um, every, every connection uh, can be found through my website, which is thehousewhisperer.tv thehousewhisperer.tv so there you can find uh, and get a copy of my book and connect with me for consultations there is a lot of information on there a lot of um, aspects of what we've spoken about this evening and also a lot of feedback from people following on from consultations so and many many YouTube videos that will illustrate what we've been touching on this evening okay that's brilliant so it's the house whisperer.tv the house whisperer.tv if you want more information now we've been inundated with um, with remarks and questions and comments tonight for the house whisperer uh, christian i think you're going to have to come back because i know that a lot of people have lost connection i think the bandwidth of listening listenership tonight has just gone crazy a lot of people have lost connection so um it's gone through the roof yeah <laughs> Has <laughs> through the roof, <laughs> through the roof. Um, so, will you come back? I will absolutely. I'd be delighted to, Pierre. Brilliant. Okay, so there you have it, folks. Um, we'll try and arrange another uh, meeting with uh, Christian, the House Whisperer. Thank you all so much for all your calls, your messages, your your tweets, your Facebook, your texts, everything. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Christian, the House Whisperer, for coming to Radio Harrow. I will be back next Sunday for more rock and radio therapy. I'm going to leave you with Blake Shelton and home.